My husband of eight years drives hundreds of miles for work every week. And because I work from home, he calls me every time he gets in the car and expects me to stay on the phone and keep him company for his hours long drives. This has been going on for years now. It is absolutely fucking maddening. And when I don't have anything left to talk about on our fifth hour on the phone that day, he says, I'm boring and starts complaining that we're just another couple who have nothing to talk about. No, motherfucker. Most couples don't talk for dozens of hours on the phone every week. Most of the time, there's eight to 10 hour gaps every day for stories and topics to accumulate. But I have no material left inside my fucking head. Everything I've seen and felt, I've already talked to you about. What else do you fucking want from me? I'm running on brain fumes. I've started faking work phone calls just to get off the phone. And sometimes I choose to work in the office because he won't call me while I'm there. But he knows the second I get off work. So as soon as I get in the car to come home, he calls me. I can't even decompress in the fucking car before coming home to see him like i wish i felt special because my husband wants to talk to me incessantly but i'm not i'm aggravated i sometimes want to listen to music or a podcast or a show on the tv but i can't because i'm on the phone with him i get overstimulated because the kids also want to talk to me and i feel like i have too many pots on the stove and my attention is being pulled in too many directions work kids spouse ims email the cats having the zoomies it just gets to me but does he understand nope he gets butthurt that he has to drive alone. Mm. Should he listen to music and podcasts? Yes. But apparently him being autistic and no, no therapy at all ever has made him severely attached to me to the point I cannot fucking breathe. Even when he's home, he is up my ass about 80% of the time. I just want to scream, leave me the fuck alone. But anytime I express needing to be alone, he makes me feel bad. I don't know if he means to. Think he does though. He has no friends and dislikes his family, which makes it all worse because I'm literally all he has. It is exhausting being the only person he has. I do not know if I can keep up with this for the rest of my life. I'm suffocating. My husband's ex-wife took us to court two years in a row for custody of their daughter, the first court case she lost. When we sent her back, my stepdaughter, on her summer vacation with her mom, Mike and I were pretty apprehensive of kind of saying goodbye to her for an extended period of time. We had her in a really great place. She was really involved in school activities. She was really involved in sports. She was involved in riding her horse. Like She was just a really happy-go-lucky kid and we were nervous that sending her back to her mom there was a very good chance that she was going to regress especially since she wasn't going to be going to counseling like she had been when she was home with us so we put her on the airplane and she heads back to wisconsin to spend the summer with her mom and the very first red flag that we saw when my stepdaughter landed back in wisconsin to spend the summer with her mom is that my husband paid for her to have a cell phone because in the court documents it stated that she needed to check in with her dad on a weekly basis so she had her own personal cell phone like we didn't want to rely on her mom to make sure that she had a phone to call us and check in so he had given her a cell phone and she'd had a cell phone actually for two years at this point and she was 11 years old 11 12 with a cell phone just so he could check in she could check in and text him at any time that he, she wanted to check in with him this was the first summer that when she went back to Wisconsin to visit her mom, that her mom took the cell phone away from her, that she could not have any access to that phone throughout the week, that she could only have access to it once a week to call him once. That was a pretty big red flag right out of the gate that something was going on that shouldn't be going on while she was visiting her mom. And she would check in with us on a regular basis, just texting, just checking in and saying, hey, how are you? What's going on? How are the dogs? How's my horse? How's life back in Washington? Silence. So we didn't want to like rock the boat a whole lot out of the gate. And I just kind of was like, meh, whatever. Mike did make a point that he was paying for her to have unlimited text and phone calling and that she really should be able to have access to her phone so that she could communicate if she wanted to with her dad or I. And the mom's reasoning, the ex-wife's reasoning was that her phone was distracting her from having quality family time with the family back in Wisconsin and she just felt like she didn't need to be on it all the time. Biggest farce ever. Huge. 
such a lie. Keep in mind that this was in 2000, 2011, so it's not like she had a smartphone. She had one of those old school, really cute pink razor flip phones. So it's not like she was on an iPhone scrolling TikTok all day. My husband's ex-wife is pretty damn savvy when it comes to how to file court charges and accusations. And when she filed this second set, we didn't get a heads up. This time I was greeted by CPS with a sheriff's deputy on our front porch. This is how I learned about the next set of accusations that she had for us. I was home alone when CPS and the sheriff showed up at our doorstep to not just serve us papers, but also wanting to interview us, which typically in cases like this, when there's no heads up, it's pretty big accusations with some pretty serious consequences. Come back for part 16 in this total shit show with the ex-wife and find out how I reacted to the sheriff and CPS and what occurred next. Click the follow button, catch up on the ex-wife series so that you know where we're at in this whole saga of multiple lawsuits in less than 24 months. My stalker is now in jail for unaliving someone. And now that he's in jail, I feel safer telling my story. Let's bring it back. I have actually known this man and his family since I was a little girl. Let's call him Freddy. So Freddy was a grown man who was still living with his parents. I wanna say he was probably like in his 20s or 30s when I was like, a child. They lived in the apartment two doors down from ours. And so every time that we would see Freddie, he would always make it a point to say hi to my mom. We would joke my mom, me and my sister, that Freddie had like a little crush on her because we would be walking as a whole family, even my dad there, and he would only say hi to her. But the whole family felt like relatively comfortable. We knew that he was like maybe a little bit off but it was fine. So his father unfortunately ends up passing away. He was like sick, so it wasn't unexpected. So now it's just him and his mom. So we start like seeing the police show up like every couple of days to that apartment. So much so that it got to the point where they were just like kind of making like weekly visits to see if everything was okay. And once in a while I would show up to my house and there would be like detective cars like parked outside, like unmarked, just watching it. They knew him by name, boom, 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 Freddy open up the door. Like, like, we're just here to check, Freddy, open up the door. Like, they, they were like buddies at that point. And we would hear them consistently screaming at each other. And it just got so much worse as time went on. We end up finding out Freddy is a diagnosed schizophrenic, which is not bad in itself. But he was always like really good on his medications. Everything was fine. We never saw problems until he decided to go off which was of course around the time where the police would be showing up to this apartment. So now I'm in my 20s. The mom is like pretty sickly and they're fighting quite a lot. We end up finding out, I'm not even sure who from, he was like physically abusing the mom. This continues to go on. And around this time is the time where he would start shifting his focus from my mom to me. It started off like pretty innocent. He would just see me and say like, hi, Kayla, and sometimes start like a little conversation. But then I started to see him like a lot more than usual. In these conversations, he would always tell me how beautiful I was, how stunning I was, and how much I looked like his wife. Hmm. Who's his wife, you may ask? In Freddie's mind, he was married to JLo. Now, in these little hallway conversations that he would stop and have with me, he would tell me that he knew JLo from the Bronx when she was, <laughs> it's funny now because of all the memes. They were like dating and they wanted to get married, but it just didn't work out because she got famous. He bought her a ring and that he proposed to her. Obviously I knew he wasn't on his medication. So I just like, you know, I was like, oh wow, that's really cool. Like I had no idea. I had to just play that part and keep myself safe. But over time, he continued and continued telling me, you look exactly like my wife, you remind me of her. And so I'm like, fuck. So this would continue every single time I saw him, which was getting to the point where it was like every single day. Just seeing him in the hallway escalated to him knocking on my door at random points in the day to come see me. There was one particular time where I was home with my grandma and her home attendant, and I hear her open the door 
and I hear Freddie's voice. She's like, no, she's not home. You need to get out of here. And so I'm a little bit confused. I'm like, you know, it's not a big deal. Like he lives, he knows where I live. He lives right in the other apartment. Like I'm just gonna go say hi to appease him. We will find out why she said that in a little while. Obviously he was doing that stuff to his mom. So I know to be wary. As a woman, I felt like I kind of had to play it smart. The man knows my apartment number for crying out loud. So he pulls up a picture of this really well-known mansion in our area. And he starts telling me that he's gonna buy it. And I'm like, that's really cool. Like, and mind you, our apartments, like teeny tiny New York City apartments. I'm like, what kind of money you got? But anyway, so he starts telling me, yeah, I'm gonna buy it like for, for you and my son and my wife. And we can all live there together. Mind you, he's showing me the picture of this well-known mansion on Google Images. And so I'm like trying to laugh it off because now I'm uncomfortable. Now I'm scared. And in this conversation, again, he's consistently telling me how much I look like his wife, Jayla, Miss Jenny from the block. So he's starting to get like more and more in depth about his son. So he tells me his son's name, it's Freddie. Let's go over this. I look like his wife, Jayla, and his son's name is Freddie. And as he's talking, he's using the position of his wife, Jaylo, and myself interchangeably, as well as himself and his son, Freddie, Freddie and Freddie, he's using their positions interchangeably as well. And so finally I get him to leave. I close the door and I immediately tell my family. So my family's not happy. My dad's pissed. And so they end up talking to my grandmother's home attendant. And she tells them that the reason that she said no is because he does that every single day. He shows up to my apartment every single day, knocks on the door and asks for me. And so obviously the home attendant is going to tell him hell no every time. I didn't know that. So I'm not sure how long passes in between these two instances. Me and my family are sitting in my living room and we hear the loudest bang on our door. It's 11 o'clock at night. My dad gets up. He's like, everybody stay here. I'm going to go check. He looks through the peephole and he decides to open the door. We're like, what the hell? It's Freddy. He's asking for me at 11 o'clock at night and my dad's like stay over there so basically he's telling my dad the same thing that he told me about this house now he's added in the point that he is actually a millionaire and that if i were to marry his son who is also freddie i would never have to worry about anything i wouldn't have to work just like his wife jayla would be set for life and he's gonna take care of me i mean his son is gonna take care of me and so my dad is like, listen, Freddie, you need to go home. This has to stop. Freddie takes it well. Now it's to the point where gifts start to show up at my house. I come home to two dozen roses in a vase with a teddy bear on it. I'm like, what's going on? The next time I get a gift, it's a dozen donuts just because. So these interactions continue to happen and it's starting to get to the point where it's way more concerning than it's ever been. When I would see him out, he would be like, hi, Kayla, say hello to me. I'd try to start the conversation about his wife, JLo, AKA me. But then there was one night where I saw him and he was beeline walking, pretty much nothing behind his eyes, completely straight face, mouth even like kind of like slightly open. Like he was not there, walked directly past me didn't even look in my direction. So after this, I do my very best at all costs to avoid this man. Now I'm freaked the fuck out. My parents are legitimately scared for my safety because we know everything that's going on in his home. However, if they see him or if I see him, we try to keep it quick, but we're still very friendly and nice. There's a point where my dad walks in on him in the hallway, face completely down, screaming, he's wailing. We know that these are a lot of mental health issues that he's having. And clearly the parents were not well equipped to continue to deal with this, especially that the mom was sick and dealing with this abuse. So my dad tries to talk him down a little bit from whatever it was that he was screaming and wailing about. And eventually he does. Whenever I go out, I have to like let my guy friends know, like, listen, can you please bring me upstairs? You no, know, this is what's going on. And we were just on the lookout for anything that may be an unsafe situation. A decent amount of time has passed where I haven't really seen too much of him and it starts to become a thing that he's like actually missing. I come home one day and there's a coroner's van outside my apartment building. I walk in the door and I see them bringing out you know what. I'm stunned, but I get upstairs and guess whose door is wide open with police and a medical team, Freddie's door.
who was the person who was sadly taken away in the van his mother so at this point everybody's minds are kind of wondering could this have been him fortunately it was determined that she had passed from natural causes she was old and sick however freddy is still missing we have no clue where he is for weeks. I bet you're asking, so who was the person that he unalived? Well, my mom tells me that she stopped in the pizza store next to our house to get a slice of pizza and that the pizza guy started to tell her how he received a call from a prison in a different state, I won't say where, from Freddy. Freddy used his prison phone call to call the pizza guy and explain why he was in jail i won't get into the full details of how this person was unalived truthfully don't have all the information but apparently it was some sort of accident at the end of the day it really is a sad story but it was genuinely pretty scary for me and my family at the time i truly hope that he does get the help that he needs but yeah everybody stay safe out there this is why you should always check if your windows are closed before bed. Oh, this is a story from my mom's childhood that she would tell us over and over again to warn us about the dangers of outside. So I'm gonna resell it to y'all because come to find out, some people actually sleep with their windows wide open. So my mom, she used to live on the island St. Lucia before she came all the way down here to the US. Where she lived, it was a pretty nice area. People were chill and crime, like that was just not a thing. It was non-existent during that time. So because nobody had anything to worry about, about, my mom used to tell us how everyone used to leave their doors unlocked like neighbors friends family They would come over unannounced and to them. It was no problem on top of that st. Lucia. It's really really hot so when it comes to Honestly, the daytime and the nighttime, the windows, they were always open. They were never shut. So my mom told me that one night, her and her sisters had to sleep over their cousin's house because my mom's parents, they were working late and they couldn't come home and cook dinner. So their aunt, they offered that they could sleep over. She told me that it was in walking distance. And as said before, everyone was friendly. Doors were unlocked, windows were opened. So they all arrive at their cousin's house. And my mom basically tells me that they do like all these girly things because you know it's a sleepover they're having fun also they were all sleeping in their cousin's room which was on the side of the house facing the road so keep that in the back of your mind fast forward it's really late around 10 ish and my mom said that her aunt came in the room telling them to all go to bed so my mom she was rebellious at the time and in saint lucia it's known that you're supposed to respect anyone that's older than you so when her aunt came in and said that it's time for bed oh you better listen and you better turn them lights off and get tucked in but my mom told me that she was not ready to go to sleep at all. Nor was her sisters and nor was her cousin. So she basically told me that she had a plan to fake out her aunt and like, you know, pretend to be asleep for like 10 minutes then wake up. <laughs> and she said that is exactly what they did. And when they knew everyone was asleep, they got up and they resumed whatever they were doing before. My mom told me that after a while, she wanted to spice things up. So she decided to tell some scary stories. And one thing about my mom is she is a wonderful storyteller. Like it will, it will keep you in. She will reel you in. Anyways here's where it got kind of creepy she told me that she was about a minute in into telling them a story about a wicked lady that would prey on those that were greedy for money when all of a sudden everyone started to hear branches cracking from outside their cousin's window she told me they all got spooked by it but didn't think anything of it until they started to hear a faint voice coming from outside my mom said that at this point her sisters immediately told her to shut up and stop telling scary stories because it's manifesting this wicked lady and in this moment all the girls were scared. So my mom told me that because she was the oldest, she decided to get up from where everyone was sitting, walked over to the window, peeked her head out to see if anything was there. She told me that as soon as she peeked her head out of the window and looked to her left and then looked to her right, she noticed a rock coming straight at her. She said the rock missed her by an inch and it instead ended up hitting the side of the house. She said out of fear, she quickly flung her head back in and immediately ran over to her sisters, hugging them because she had no idea where it came from. She told me that second later that same faint voice became more clear and it was the sound of an older man she told me how her cousin had a window curtain and because of that the girls could see the silhouette of the man standing right outside the window 
At this point, they were all petrified and frozen because not only is there a stranger right there, but the window is wide open. She said the man started mumbling some words, which sounded kind of drunk. And then seconds later, he started to climb through the window. Also, when I say the window is fully wide open, I don't mean it's like the full thing open. It's like the halfway windows, if you know what I mean. So my mom told me that he started with his leg and then his arm, like going sideways in. And my mom told me that as soon as she saw that he was getting inside, she had to do something fast. That's when she took the nearest shoe, ran over to the window and started hitting the man. My mom told me that because one of his legs and an arm was inside when she started hitting him he ended up losing balance and he fell backwards the only thing though is that when he started to fall back he reached far enough and was able to grab onto my mom's shirt it was like right around here she told me that he was able to regain his balance and because he had a grip on her he was able to hold her against the window so my mom says she let out a scream and that's when her cousin and sisters immediately ran over she said her sisters were pulling her back which eventually made him lose his grip on her and my mom's cousin began shutting the window on him when her cousin ended up closing the window and ended up getting caught on his leg and arm so he was like bent over at this point so the man starts yelling in agony and here's where it gets kind of disgusting so as soon as the man starts yelling my mom told me that her cousin got startled and opened the window so that the man can you know get out as soon as he lifted his leg out she shut it again but his finger wasn't fully out like he was pulling his arm back it ended up slamming on the bottom and his middle finger it ended up slightly coming off so the man is outside tugging on his hand and she said she was quite literally watching as his finger was getting ripped off she said her aunt came busting into the room to see what was going on because she heard a ruckus and in short she ended up calling the cops and told them not to open up that window until the police comes once the police arrived my mom said that she had to explain what happened and everyone said that they have never seen this man before in the town and they don't even know where he came from but he got taken away and he went to jail my mom told me that after that day the story got told all around town and after that nobody slept with their windows open and doors unlocked my mom also thanks herself because she said if she wasn't rebellious and went to sleep that could have ended way differently and possibly so much more worse being that it was a grown man and little girls but this is the story my mom used to tell us all the time and now i encourage y'all to not sleep with their windows open lock them right now Am I the asshole for not letting my sister use my house for her home birth? My younger sister is currently four months pregnant and has always been scared of hospitals. I knew this wouldn't be easy for her, but she's decided to forego the hospital altogether and wants a home birth. The only issue is she and her significant other live in a thin-walled apartment, so for obvious reasons, she can't do it there without someone thinking something's wrong. Here's where the issue comes up. I have a house. A shitty, small one-bedroom, but a house. She wants to have the baby there so she can have a home home birth somewhere familiar and safe. There's a few issues I have with that. For one, I have a one bedroom, so she'd either be giving birth in my bed or on my couch, neither of which I look forward to cleaning up, not to mention there's the risk of something going wrong. And not to sound insensitive, but I don't want to be found liable for anything. I called to explain all of that to her, and she guilt-tripped me, calling me a bad sister, saying I was being selfish. I reminded her that she should probably just go to the hospital like a normal person, or if she didn't like the idea of that, she was welcome to call off the pregnancy since there's still time. Okay. Now she's been shaming me to everyone in the family, and I have relatives on my back saying I should just let her have the baby here. That I literally nearly died of sepsis a few years ago. I just walked past a um, campaign banner and people out walking, raising awareness for sepsis um, and, you know, spotting the signs. And I saw people of all ages, and I think it really reminds me of that time where, yeah, I just thought I was absolutely fine, thought maybe I was having like a bit of a flu starting, and all of a sudden, um, things just took a huge turn. Um, literally, I got up in the morning, went to work that day, midday I started feeling a bit weird, just not quite right, um, just a bit achy, just feeling off. And um, by five o'clock in the evening, leaving work, I just didn't, didn't feel good at all. Cycled home from work, um, had a shower, and I was gonna go to bed, thinking I just need to go and sleep things off. Um, but my friends called me and said, we need to do this house viewing because we need to new, move to a new place. And I was like, okay, fine, I feel rough, but sure. So I got changed and suddenly just started feeling really off. And the first moment, look, run club, love it. The first moment I realized things were turning bad was I just suddenly started feeling really hot and flushed in my face. I looked at my hands and they were mottled. Um, they were kind of like gray, basically looking gray. And I did something really stupid. Rather than calling an ambulance, I got on the tube, which was right by my house, and I got the tube from Canada Water to Westminster Tube Station. And in the process of walking from Westminster Tube Station over the bridge, the short walk to St. Thomas's Hospital, I nearly collapsed twice. By the time that I walked in, 
I nearly passed out in the reception. In fact, the receptionist, I think, thought I was drunk. Bearing in mind, I left work at five. This is about 7.30 on a Wednesday. Um, that's how kind of confused I was and how slurred my speech was and how probably ill I looked. Luckily, a very experienced triage nurse walked past me and said, what is going on with this guy? And I said, look, I'm a doctor. I've left work. I think I've got sepsis. I'm really, really sick. And pretty much I collapsed on the bed. Next thing you know, um, as far as I remember, the rest of it was quite a haze, but they pulled like the emergency buzzer because my news, my early warning score was very high, which meant I was very sick, and therefore my statistical probability of death basically was very high. So I was rushed through into the resus department, which is where most sick people go. And I remember lying on the bed, looking up at the monitor, people putting lines in my arms, so you know, putting to give medications and that, taking blood tests, doing all these different things. And I was looking up at the monitor thinking, oh this is bad um, because even in my state of illness i was well aware what the numbers kind of meant above me which was really really frightening what happened next is i was given a lot of treatment very fast so what i would call nuclear antibiotics so kind of sepsis antibiotics uh, gentamicin i can't remember what the other one was but I had antibiotics given to me and a lot of fluid because in sepsis effectively you get uh, what you call a septic shock so um you're Blood pressure goes through the floor. You know, if you've been having temperatures, you've basically become really dehydrated. And the risk of this sudden septic uh, shock is that it can kill your kidneys, your brain. Basically, it can, it can kill you. And, you know, the, the mortality rate of those with uh, sepsis is up to about 30%. It's very, very high. So the amazing team of doctors and nurses there treated me very quickly. It was very frightening, though, because I had a litre of stat fluid, what we'd say, so fluid given very, very quickly through the vein. It did absolutely nothing for my blood pressure, which I found very frightening. I think my systolic, so my bigger number of the blood pressure was like 85, 90, which was very frightening. My heart rate was like 140, 150 sinus, which means my body was working really, really hard to kind of maintain perfusion, so blood supply. It was really, really scary. And after I had that first bag, I thought, wow, I'm in real big trouble here. They gave me literally two more liters very, very quickly. I'm a young person. It's very young, it's about 25, 26, 25, 26 at the time. So they gave me fluid fast and my blood pressure started coming up. Um, and I started feeling a bit more hopeful um, and I had fantastic care. Uh, the intensive care doctors came down to have a look at me, but by that point, my I'd responded well to treatment. I was still very, very sick, but I could go to a, you know, um, medical ward to have like high level care and medical ward basically, um, rather than being in intensive care. So I didn't need to be intubated or put in a coma at that point. But had I got worse, then that would have been the next thing. It would have been medications to boost my blood pressure, which are, you know, they're no joke. Uh, and also probably being put in a medically induced coma. That's how serious things were. And that's how quickly sepsis can go from well in the morning. I went to work. I worked in the hospital in the day looking after people with sepsis, ironically. And then by seven o'clock in the evening, you know, I was nearly dying. And, you know, the next morning when the consultant, another consultant came around on the medical ward, she said to me that she believes, and I obviously am aware of this as well, that had I have gone to bed that evening and gone to sleep, I probably wouldn't be there the next day. It's the reality of it. And often the young people, they just go to bed and think, oh, I'll just sleep it off. And, might not wake up and I know this might be triggering but it's an important story to share because if my friends hadn't have called me and tried to drag me to this house viewing and had I not have you know clicked and realized what I was hurtling towards which was septic, septic shock I don't think I'd be here today quite frankly and that was a very pivotal moment in my life I had a few moments in my life that have been real wake-up calls to live and do things and live your life that was certainly one of them I then proceeded to spend a week in hospital. I could barely walk for about four days. Uh, bearing in mind, I was very, very fit at the time. I could hardly walk down the corridor. I, as someone with ADHD, I really struggled to be in the, um, in the side room. Um, they never found out the cause, by the way, of the infection. Um, that's sometimes the case. You just don't find out what caused it. Um, but ultimately, like it really took it out of me. I really found it hard to be unable to move. And it was the mental effects that were huge as well. So I left the hospital a week later and I just wanted to be able to be back to my normal self. But it took like three or four months, at least that, for my body to recover. And I was very teary, I was very upset, very, very like frightened that I wouldn't be myself again. It was a horribly frightening experience. So I think the, the message I kind of want to share and the reason I've rambled on for six minutes is that just have you know an understanding a little bit of what sepsis is if you look on the sepsis trust website there's a mnemonic there to help uh, remember some of the signs but you know if you're suddenly becoming ill you're feeling hot if you're faint your hands get mottled your heart rate's really high something's not right 
just go to the doctor, don't go to bed, don't just think I'm gonna sleep this off. Like, it feels different, you know something's really wrong. When you've got a cold or something, you know you're just feeling like there's a cold. But when your gut is telling you, mm, there's something not right, don't ignore it, get help. Like, and I'm just so grateful St. Thomas's Hospital I said this before, very, very grateful. Like, I literally wouldn't be here. Like, I wouldn't be here without the treatment they gave me and I wasn't in a position to help myself. Um, I don't know if I said it earlier in the story, but I was incredibly confused. Um, really struggled to give a history of what was going on um, because, yeah, I was so sick. So, yeah, keep an eye out. Check out what, you know, sepsis is. If in doubt, just get help. Go to the hospital. And, you know, my lesson is if you're worried it's sepsis, then call 999. You know, dial 999. It's an emergency. It's a medical emergency with a high mortality rate, but something we can treat. And with the right treatment most people can get better so yeah there you go sometimes you see something it triggers a trail of thoughts and that's what's happened today so that was my story